for coming to this presentation. We're going to be talking about the power of data visualization today and learning about data visualization best practices, as well as applying the best practices that we learn to crisis data. So I am Julia Baidry or Julia Baidry Gonzalez, whichever you prefer. I'm a senior solution engineer at Tableau Software, um, and I'm really excited to talk to you all about data visualization today. So if there's any questions that you have throughout the session, feel free to drop them in the chat. I will also uh, pause at various points and you can come off of mute and ask them live as well. So the way that this presentation is going to be structured today is we're going to be talking about data visualization as a topic, why it's important. Um, then we're gonna be talking about the science of visual analysis, um, why data visualization can help us see and understand patterns and insights in our data. Uh, we'll be learning a couple of best practices that you can apply to your own work. And then we'll be looking at a real time, a real life use case where we'll apply the concepts that we've learned to a ACLID data source that uh, is related to crisis events across the world related to the COVID-19 pandemic. So again, feel free to drop questions in the chat as we go along and I hope you enjoy. So you may have been you know, on a trip or you may have been hiking and you may have come across a crossroads in the road that looks something like this. And so say you're a traveler, or you're not sure exactly where you should be going next. If you come to something like this in the road, it's understandable that you could be a little bit confused about what to do next. Um, there's a lot of different signage. There's many, many different paths to take. You're not sure exactly uh, what is the optimal path to take or you know, where to go next. And so this kind of crossroads in the road that we come to is something that I like to use to illustrate the importance of data visualization um, and visual analytics. So when we create a dashboard or, or when, when we create data visualization from our data sets, what we wanna do is basically the exact opposite of what you're seeing here. We want to guide our users through our analytics with a a purpose-driven process. And we want to make sure that our users feel kind of supported um, through every step of the way and visual cues are pointed out to them throughout um, their experience with our visual analytics products. So the opposite of this is what we really want to accomplish with data visualization. What we really want to accomplish is clarity. So we're gonna to talk today a little bit about the science of visual analytics, how we can utilize the pre-attentive attributes in the brain to help guide our users um, through data-driven decisions and how to best design our data visualization products to help users see and understand our data. So before we dive into it, just a couple of um, you know, definitions here. What is a dashboard and what is visual analysis? So a dashboard, it's a visual display of the most important information needed to achieve a couple of objectives, consolidated, arranged on a single screen so the information can be monitored as a glance. So we want to be answering some of the questions, not all of the questions. We want our information to be consolidated and we want our users to be able to take actions off of that decision, quick, uh, off of that analytics quickly and easily. So what is visual anal and analysis? Visual analytics is a representation and presentation of data that exploits our visual perception abilities in order to amplify cognition. So we're gonna be talking about this a little bit more in a second, but how do we basically hack the human brain to guide our users through our visual analytics products and point out the data that they should be looking at and help them come to their own conclusions. So just discussing two quick historical examples of why data visualization is so important. So Florence Nightingale, um, this is a really famous visualization here on the right. It's called uh, a coxcomb graph. And basically what Florence Nightingale understood was um, on the battlefields, she was noticing that a lot of the soldiers were not dying from battlefield related causes, but actually from preventable communicable diseases. So in order to um, communicate her insights, she created this coxcomb diagram that showed just how many proportionally uh, soldiers were dying from preventable diseases, which is in the light gray, versus actual battlefield related deaths. So as you can see, um, compared to, for example, an Excel or, or a spreadsheet or something, you know, a journal where these data points are written out one by one, looking at it in this digestible visual way is a really great way to get that point across and possibly save lives. Here's another historical example of, of data visualization. Um, so cholera in London, the uh, historical cholera outbreak in London. Uh, what you're seeing on the right is a 
in red, um, the cholera outbreaks, and then in blue, the location of water pumps. So John Snow actually charted out this data on a map showing the relationship between the location of water pumps and the cholera outbreaks in London and was able to draw a conclusion about how cholera, the spread of cholera was related to the water. So again, this is just another historical example of how we can use data visualization to highlight important, um, important insights that may not have been immediately understandable if we were looking at the data in a tabular um, or a text-based view. So what we're really trying to do here, again, is hack the human brain, take advantage of our pre-attentive uh, visual perception, and point our users to the data that's most important for them to see so they can make clear data-driven decisions. So we're going to play a little bit of a game in a second um, to kind of illustrate this point here. So introduction to the game. Um, this is a Where's Waldo. So uh, hopefully a lot of you are familiar with Where's Waldo. Uh, basically this visual here is designed for maximum visual confusion. So we're trying to make it as hard as possible to find out where Waldo is. Um, and you can see there's various different techniques in order to make it as difficult as possible to find Waldo. There's a lot of bright colors. There's a lot of, um, you know, many different things happening at the same time. There's no one thing is much larger than the other. There's, there's a lot of stuff in the foreground, a lot of stuff in the background. So there's a lot of visual confusion going on here. Um, and what we're trying to do is obscure information. However, what if we wanted to quickly find where Waldo was? Um, I think this is a an, an interesting example here because um, as we're all still, you know, within the COVID-19 pandemic, the social distancing edition of Where's Waldo? So you can see Waldo is immediately apparent because there's not a lot of visual noise around Waldo. Waldo is wearing a striped shirt, which, um, you know, using those colors makes him easy to stand out. Uh, he's also waving his hand, which is a little bit visually different from the rest of the people in this picture. So uh, when we're thinking about designing visual analytics, uh, we want you know, our data that's the most important to stand out, much like Waldo does in this image versus the one before. So now we're going to play our little game. Um, I hope you all have your chats open and ready because I'm going to ask you a question. We're going to look at a diagram and I'm going to ask you to count the number of nines in the numerical grid that we see. So as soon as you've counted all the number of nines in this numerical grid, feel free to drop your answer in the chat. So everyone should be counting the number, total number of nines in this grid and then answering in the chat. Okay, we're getting a couple of answers coming in. All right, quite a bit of variety in the answers here. As you can see, it's pretty difficult to count these nines when you know they are combined with all these different numbers. There's a lot of visual noise here. All right, we've got a couple of answers. All right, so what we're going to do now is we're going to play the same game. And I want you now to do this exact same thing. Just count the nines and get your answer in the chat as soon as you have the answer. All right, awesome. So this has illustrated my point right here. So the first go around, it took probably 15, 20 seconds for anyone to respond at all. Uh, there was quite a bit of variety between the answers. We were getting, you know, 13, seven, four, um, kind of all over the place. And then basically as soon as I showed um, this second version of the number grid, we got the correct answer 10 pretty much instantaneously within three or four seconds. And it was very accurate, you know, amongst everyone who answered. So. What we're trying to illustrate here is the power of pre-attentive visual attributes to call out information and make data visible to users. So when we talk about pre-attentive attributes of visual perception, these are the different kind of design concepts we're talking about. When the human brain and the human eye looks at certain things, certain things are immediately drawn to us. So not only color, which you can see in the bottom left, but also things like length, width, 
orientation, size or shape, the curvature, the enclosure or the blur of a line or a dot. So when we see a shape on the screen, if it stands out from the rest, if it's different, if it's bigger, for example, if it's oriented slightly differently, or if we're using color, like in the last example, um, things will stand out to us much more readily in our brain. Um, so when we're designing data visualizations and visual analytics, we wanna take advantage of these pre-attentive attributes of visual perception to call that data out to our users. All right, so let's talk a little bit about dashboard design now that we've learned a little bit about how, you know, how the brain uh, is drawn to information and how to take advantage of pre-attentive visual attributes. So when we're designing visual analytics and dashboards, we want to make them intuitive. We want to make the data current. We wanna make them interactive and we wanna make the dashboards actionable. So when someone looks at a visualization, they should be able to know what kind of questions it's answering within the first couple of seconds. The data should be up to date or it should, um, it should be shown on the chart how, off, how often the data is updated or how frequent the data is refreshed. We want it to be interactive. So we want our users to really be able to take a guided analytics approach and dive into our data in an inter interactive manner. And we also want the data to be actionable. So at the end of the day, the point of designing a dashboard or a visual analytics product is to you know, change our user's mind, have them take an action off of it, have them be able to make a data-driven decision. And so another concept of dashboard design, you can see time and value here on the X and Y axes. Um, these are different types of dashboards that you could design kind of across your visual analytics um, journey. So the uh, really good dashboards can be descriptive or diagnostic. Um, so what happened? Why did it happen? These are some of the questions that we can answer. Um, however, the best dashboards, again, moving towards those actionable decisions here is what will happen? So what may happen in the future? And how do we make it happen? What do we do to make it happen? So we're moving here from descriptive to diagnostic to predictive to, descript to prescriptive. Um, I like to use kind of the what, why, how framework for this. Um, and I like to design my dashboards kind of in tiered views based off of this framework or based off of you know, highest level of information down to the most detailed information in order to make a decision. Anatomy of a dashboard. So we see a dashboard here on the right and um, there's a couple of best practices that I wanna call out based off of this visual example here and what we have on the left. So the best dashboards pass the five second rule. We should be able to know what kind of questions the dashboard is answering after five seconds of coming out to the page. So uh, there's a lot of ways to accomplish this, including some of the best practices we're about to discuss. The dashboard should answer a set of questions, not all. So we don't want to you know, answer the universe with our dashboard. We, want, we don't wanna throw our data at the wall and you know, we don't wanna have 15 different views confusing the user. We want to answer a specific scoped set of questions. The dashboard should also be guided and interactive. So as you move through the dashboard, there should be a storyline, a clear beginning, middle and end. There should be interactivity so that the user can you know, click around, zero in on the data that they want to focus on. So there should be an intuitive flow from one view to another. There are ways that you can do this is tiering the dashboard like you see on the right, adding text that kind of guides the user through the dashboard, um, starting at the highest level of information and moving down to the lowest level uh, or the most granular level of information. This is a general rule of thumb, but less than five worksheets per a single pane of glass is a general best practice. So more than five different um, you know, data visualizations on a single page can be pretty overwhelming for a user. So we just wanna make sure that we're keeping the level of visual noise low and that the users can focus on and understand what we're presenting to them. Um, clear use of text for direction. Again, you can see on the right here, um, they're using questions to kind of guide the user um, from the beginning of the dashboard through the middle. There's clear textual cues on you know, what's being arranged on the chart. Um, and it kind of makes sense from top to bottom. And then of course our dashboarding ABCs, accuracy, brevity, and clarity. Um, we always want to keep these in mind as we're designing a dashboard product. It sounds like someone has come off mute. Is there a question at this point? Okay, maybe not. Of course, feel free to drop in the chat if you do have one. 
So we're going to play another quick game here. Uh, we, I want to take a look at this graph on the left, this dashboard, and I want you to let me know in the chat what do you think in terms of the design of this dashboard? What's the content? What question is this dashboard trying to answer? How is the design? You know, what's your in, what's your kind of um, gut reaction to it, and what's the messaging here of the dashboard? So let me know what your thoughts are here in the chat. All right, we're getting a couple of answers. Yep, it's a little much, confusing, crowded, overstimulating, very busy. Is it hotel data? That's a good question. So that kind of illustrates the point of, you know, we should know what the data is about based off of the design. So the fact that you're asking that question also points to, you know, the nature of the design of this dashboard. What do the colors mean? It's difficult to know without a key. Mixed month and year, too much information. Exactly. So there's a lot of visual noise on this dashboard. There's eight different charts. There's about five different filters. They're not really arranged in a way that, um, you know, make it visually clean to the user. There's multiple different color legends going on. Um, we've got a lot of kind of bright, dark design colors here. We're not exactly sure what they mean. Um, all of the charts are line charts, but we also don't know what the area chart versus the line means. So there's just a lot of stuff going on. It's difficult to understand, exactly. So let's take a look at the next example and let's repeat the same uh, exercise. So what do we think in terms of what question the dashboard is answering? What's the content, the design and the messaging? All right, we're getting a couple of answers in now. Now it's clearly about a hotel. Clarity, clear content design messaging, distinct answers, absolutely. Same content, but much better, yep, exactly. Revenue and occupancy. Filters are better presented, absolutely. So these two dashboards um, that I just presented to you are using the exact same data set. Um, so you can see just the total realm of difference between if we're looking on the left versus looking on the right, how different the experience for the user is based off of the literal same data set that um, each of the designers started out with. So this is a, a dashboard about hotel occupancy and revenue, um, like some of you all noticed here. But we can see between the left and the right. Uh, on the left, we're not exactly sure what's going on. Um, all of the line charts are very busy with many different colors, and we're not sure what that even means. However, on the right, we're seeing that the color orange is being used to call out specific information. So the pre-attentive attribute of color is calling our eye to the orange. We can see um, using sizing as well, some of the line charts, we can see the, um, the largest number of rooms sold versus availability. In Mexico, uh, we've got our our um, KPIs up at the top as well, which is a best practice when we're designing a dashboard for an executive. Um, and then in the heat map below, it's very apparent, you know, what's being shown in terms of the hotspots per percent of total revenue. So our titles make sense, our colors are aligned, uh, we're using one color legend, and things just are much clearer, um, there's more white space, and it's just better arranged in general. Um, it's also pleasing to the eye, which is another great call out um, by one of you in the chat. Although aesthetics can kind of sound like a fuzzy thing, it's actually extremely important in visual analytics to make the user experience pleasant um, on the dashboard. So pleasing to the eye, that is actually very important. All right, so we're gonna talk about a couple of tactical best practices now. Um, so we're gonna go, kind of take apart a dashboard and take a look at um, you know, what are the different best practices that we can employ in our own design of visual analytics? And then we're going to jump into our actual use case using our ACLID data um, on COVID-19 related um, unrest or crises around the world. 
So dashboarding to tell a story. There are a couple of tactical best practices that I want to go through with you before we jump into our use case. So you can see on the right, this is the dashboard that I've designed for the purpose of this conference. Um, it's COVID-19 related unrest worldwide. Um, there's also a country profile view that I'll show you interactively a little bit later. Um, but we can use it to illustrate some of the design best practices that we can employ in our own work when designing data visualization products. So position, the most important view should go on a dashboard in the top or the top left. Um, we've done quite a bit of user analysis and we've noticed that users tend to, when they um, enter a dashboard or when they first see a dashboard, their eye tends to go directly to the top left kind of like a newspaper layout and then uh, tend to work from Z formation from the left to the right, across down to the bottom and then across to the right bottom corner. So position is important. If there's something you want your users to see right away, um, putting it in the top or the top left corner is, is a great way for the user to see it first. So color, avoid too many color schemes on a single dashboard. Um, you saw from the example that we just looked at from the hotel chains dashboard that the single um, orange to blue color scheme was being utilized. Um, you can see here on the right that we're using purple to designate a COVID-19 related unrest or protest event. Um, and then orange is being used down below to compare those protests or unrest events to um, the number of cases, number of new cases per week of the coronavirus. Number of views, so five or fewer views in a single dashboard is a best practice. Again, this is a rule of thumb. There are some um, exceptions. Um, however, you know, reducing the visual noise is always very important and using navigation to move from dashboard to dashboard. If you have more information to present, then uh, makes sense on a single screen, adding buttons, you know, adding interactivity, allowing your user to flow from the highest level to the lowest level of information. Text, make titles, captions, and legends easily understandable. So you can see here, this dashboard has a very clear hierarchy. Um, we've got non-data related ink in caps. So the title, the filters and the legends, they're all in this dark blue that matches the logo and the button below. Um, they're all differentiated from the actual data uh, ink by these lines here on the top and on the left. The filters and the legends are very clearly labeled. Um, there's some instructions up in the top left as well. So when the user comes onto the dashboard, they see the instructions first. Um, and the dashboard just has a very clear hierarchy here. Um, so Titles, captions, and legends, easily understandable, um, is very important to kind of structure your visualization for your user. Arrangement, so using white space strategically, minimizing non-data ink, like I just said, uh, there's not a lot of visual noise on this dashboard other than the data itself. So you can see I've chosen to whitewash the map even so that we can see the kind of incidence of different events across the world. We're looking at events by size, so larger events will have a larger bubble. Um, the same color legends using being used across and as much extraneous lines and kind of, um, you know, different chart dividers have been removed as possible to make sure that the data is really front and center. And then, of course, provide interactivity. So we'll see when I live demo this dashboard, the different interactivity options I've provided um, and the way that you can flow from this highest level worldwide information down to the country profile. Uh, we have an interesting question here. Does positioning importance change for right to left languages or does it hold? That is a great question. I actually don't know the answer to that, um, but I would love to research that for you. So um, if you want to grab my email, um, I can follow up with that on you later. Um, but that's really interesting. That, that is a good question. All right, so let's move into each of these tactical best practices one by one, and then we'll go into the live dashboard example. So position um, from our user research, and then again, with the caveat here, I'll have to look into that for right to left languages. That's very interesting. Um, so from our research, we found that the top left corner and also the center of a dashboard is emphasized. So as you move across the dashboard, you can see the different quadrants here on where you'd wanna place your most important visualizations versus kind of supporting information or details here. Um, so the newspaper or Z formation is the general best practice here. color. So like I said before, um, when we looked at the hotel executives dashboard, there was a lot of different bright or highlight colors going on and that was kind of causing the sensory overkill. Um, the bright color should be reserved for the data that stands out from the rest. So when we're utilizing our color legends, we want to make sure that we select maybe just one bright color and then have the rest of the colors in the legend 
uh, be kind of a little bit more muted or faded, especially if we're looking to call out a specific data point on the dashboard. So the use of red, yellow, or green on the dashboard, we wanna keep in mind that there are a significant percentage of people across the world who are colorblind, and especially red, green color palettes can exclude these people because it's very hard for um, folks with colorblindness to distinguish red and green. So you'll actually notice that the design of Tableau, the platform, uh, the data visualization software and, and the place that I work, um, the default color palette is actually blue to orange. So um, blue to orange is a lot more friendly for um, you know, colorblind folks. And then colors that are common in nature work very well as color palettes for dashboards. So um, designing your dashboards, you know, uh, getting inspiration from nature can be a great way to kind of design color palettes for your dashboard. And apologies, I'm in a city. I'm just gonna wait for that to go by. All right. So our next best practice, five or fewer views. Um, this is again, the executive dashboard that we looked at earlier for the hotel related data. As you can see, there's eight different charts here. Um, we're very confused as to what this dashboard really means. Um, but the point here is that, you know, five or fewer views is the best practice for a single pane of glass or a single visualization dashboard. The more visualizations you add beyond five, it may start to add, you know, visual noise or visual complexity to the screen and may start to confuse your user. So again, five is a rule of thumb. Uh, there are exceptions for sure, but it's a good kind of um, rule of thumb to keep in mind as you're designing your dashboards. Intuitive titles and captions. Um, so different dashboard designers that I have encountered have taken many different approaches to this. Some folks prefer to use the title of their dashboard as a question. So like we saw in the dashboard before, um, asking a question in the title can tell us exactly what the dashboard is about, tell us exactly the question that the dashboard is setting out to answer. Um, putting the dashboard title in a statement, um, kind of stating your conclusion right away can also be a very effective way to design a dashboard title. So you can see here on this example that um, the conclusion of this dashboard, the overrepresentation of Black, Latinx, and Asian Americans here is just stated directly in the title. Um, the color orange is also used to show, um, you know, in the dashboard which bars to look at in terms of overrepresentation. So that's another way to go about it. You could also just, you know, write a very clear kind of thesis title for your dashboard. So there's many different ways to go about this, but as long as it's intuitive to your user, quick and easy to understand, um, that's a general rule of thumb for your titles and captions. Utilizing white space and minimizing non-data ink. So here's a couple of examples of some, what I would call legacy dashboard designs. Um, you can see here on the left, the example that I brought in is because there's a lot of extraneous, just noise in the dashboard. There's um, you know, a lot of different dark borders around the different visualizations. There's um, you know, access tick lines that are probably not necessary. Um, you know, we've got a lot of different visualizations again on the dashboard, we've got, looks like, you know, nine or 10 here. Um, and there's just like a lot of noise happening, a lot of different things competing for your attention. On the right, we have a 3D visualization. Again, this is not a best practice. Um, we have multiple axes going on. It's, you know, it's, it's challenging your depth perception. There's um, a lot of extraneous kind of shading and coloring going on. So Minimizing non-data ink and utilizing white space is a great way to make your dashboard clear and to make it past that five second rule that we talked about earlier. So getting rid of extraneous lines, getting rid of um, extraneous details that don't actually help your user understand the data is a great design best practice as you're arranging the different elements on your dashboard. So now that we've talked about the tactical best practices, let's talk a little bit about the kind of intangibles here. So beyond kind of positioning, sizing, color, using, utilizing white space, the things that we've just discussed, does the visualization type make sense for the data? So when we look at data over time, what's the best way to visualize that type of data? Um, you know, general best practice would be a line chart in that case. 
So there's a lot of different tools on the internet that can address this question, and I'm going to provide one to you at the end of the session. Um, but thinking about, you know, what's the best way to visualize your data to make it immediately apparent to your users? So I've seen a lot of great examples of visualization types being utilized very effectively in this way. Um, one of the great examples that I like to call to a lot is I, I saw a dashboard um, around, you know, rising temperatures over time in terms of global warming. And the designer used a heat map uh, style visualization to illustrate their point. And so using a heat map to literally talk about temperature was a very intuitive way to visualize that data. Um, so there's some great examples of this out there on the web that I can also share with you at the end. Um, but keep this question in mind as you're designing. What's the best way to visualize this type of data? Is it a guided analytics experience? So like we talked about earlier, the what, why, how framework or the high level, you know, highest level um, executive KPI information down to more detail. Is the dashboard kind of set up in a way that tells a story and that makes sense for a user to, to walk through it? Um, and also, are you utilizing interactivity to really make it a guided experience for users? So does it make sense where the user should click, where the user should use a navigation button? Um, are there clear instructions? Are you utilizing text to help your user understand what to do next? Does the dashboard answer the question that the title poses? So this is extremely important. You know, um, as you're designing a dashboard, you always want to keep that central question in mind. Why am I doing this to begin with? What are my requirements? Who is my audience? Um, so we'll discuss the design process a little bit later, but always keep that central question in mind. What is my dashboard answering? How am I helping my users make decisions? Is the dashboard pretty? So this is very important. Like we saw before, um, you know, the dashboards that we looked at for the hotel executive, one of them was very not pretty and one of them was. Um, and we, of course, used best practices to get to that state of quote unquote pretty, but the Pleasant visual experience of the dashboard actually helps facilitate the user to find the information they need quickly because um, the user doesn't have a visceral reaction to the dashboard uh, that's negative. The user has a positive reaction. And, you know, that's just one more thing that they don't have to think about as they're finding the data that they need. And also, of course, do my users care? So, again, this goes back to, you know, gathering your requirements, knowing your audience, but you could design the most effective dashboard that answers the question that follows all of these other best practices that we've discussed. But if it's a mismatch between, you know, what the question that you've answered and what your users actually need, then the dashboard's not going to be very effective because the users are coming on there looking for one thing and you're presenting something great, but it's not what they're looking for. So it's very important to always keep the audience in mind as you're designing and understand what the requirements are. And this is a very cyclical process. Um, but just make sure that you're always designing to the brief. All right, so I'll stop here really quickly. We just went through a lot of information. Uh, we're about to jump into the use case itself, but I wanted to see if there's any questions at this point, any comments or feedback. Um, so we'll wait for that in the chat if there are any. And I see we've got a article. Thank you for sharing on right to left languages. So this is really interesting. I'm going to take a look at this a little bit later, but that is a great call out, especially for our international audiences. Any other questions at this point or thoughts about any of the best practices? All right, awesome. Thanks, Paige. Cool. So if there's no questions at this point, we're going to move into the next section of the presentation where we're going to start to apply some of these design best practices to um, our crisis data. So, oh, we have a question from Gabrielle. Do these best practices also apply to non-interactive dashboards? Absolutely. So of course, the interactivity portion, uh, when you have an infographic type visualization, you can't really accomplish interactivity in that way. However, a lot of the things we've discussed around color, utilizing white space, um, you know, making your, your text and your labeling clear, this is all di directly applicable to infographic type non-interactive dashboards as well. So I would say pretty much everything here other than navigation and interactivity would also directly apply to any um, static 
um, visualizations that you would create. All right. So if there's nothing else, I will go ahead and move on to our next segment here. Our use case, the ACLID COVID-19 data source. So what I'm going to do with this dashboard is I'm going to jump into the interactive version of it. I will demonstrate the dashboard for you, kind of move through a user path um, for the dashboard. Um, we're going to click around, you know, test out the different features of the dashboard. And then we're going to discuss the best practices of this dashboard. What does this dashboard do well? What could it do better? What other questions arise in your mind as you go through this dashboard? Um, and then I can talk a little bit about the design process as well. So I'm going to jump out of my screen for a second, and I'm going to jump into my interactive version. All right. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. All right, fantastic. Perfect. All right. So what you're looking at right now is we're inside Tableau Desktop right now, and we're looking at the dashboard that I created using the ACLID data source on COVID-19 related unrest worldwide. So um, for those of you who are familiar with ACLID, they're a fantastic resource in terms of um, very clean, very organized crisis related data. So I pulled a data set related to COVID-19. Um, because I have been focusing a lot on COVID-19 and some of my work with um, Tableau and, and the Tableau, uh, the various Tableau data hubs recently. So it was very interesting to me to kind of continue in this topic and see how COVID-19 relates to various crisis events worldwide. So I will give you a quick demonstration of the dashboard. Um, then we're going to talk a little bit about the design process and then we'll, you know, ask some questions around, you know, what does this dashboard do well? What could it do better? Um, and kind of have a little bit of an dis open discussion around that. So COVID-19 related unrest worldwide. So this is our highest level view of the dashboard. We can see on our left, we have all of our instructions. So our instructions are saying, um, select a country to view country level data, select country profile to see country specific event details. So once we've taken a look at our worldwide data, we can select a country from the filters um, we can take a look at country related info and then we can go to our country profile, which is our second level view to get a little bit more information around the individual events in a specific country. We've got um, filters on country and event type, so we can take a look at individual countries as well as um, an event type, for example, protests, riots, strategic developments. Um, and then we've also got our legends laid out in terms of event size right here. So. In the top of the dashboard, we have our logo, um, NYUCIC, which sponsored this conference. We've got our title. It's in all caps, COVID-19 related unrest worldwide. And then we have an interactive element here in the title span as well um, around the number of events that are being displayed in the data set overall. So we have 47,000 events in the dashboard um, and we're looking at the time period from 2020 to 2021. So we have those two years in the domain. So as I look around the dashboard, you can see as I hover on the map itself, all of these different events taking place. We can see the latitude and longitude, the event size itself, as well as the notes on the event. So we can see the date that it took place, as well as what actually occurred at that time. So the interesting thing about the ACLA data source is that the size of the event, you can see at the end of the notes section where it says size over 700. I actually created a calculation of a regex or a regular expression calculation to pull that number out of the notes field and create a whole new column uh, with that number in it. So that's how I was able to get the event size and I was able to use that for the size of the bubble here. Um, so that kind of goes into the design process and understanding your data first before you start to build visualizations on it. So on our right here, we have our different event types. If we select, we can see that the dashboard updates and we can take a look at that specific event type across the world.
You can see our, our dashboard automatically updates here. So we're checking the box of interactivity, at least in this point. And then down below, what I did with this data set was I related it to a Tableau COVID-19 data hub data source, um, comparing the events over the course of 2020 and 2021 to the new cases per week. So I wanted to see if there was any sort of uh, relationship between the incidence of events and the incidence of the new cases per week of the coronavirus. And so you can see a little bit here um, that as the COVID-19 cases spike, we see these three different waves. We can see a kind of a similar kind of lagging indicator of the events also spiking in three distinct waves here. So my hypothesis here is, is it's, um, it may not directly be related to the number of cases per week, but more uh, possibly the government response to the coronavirus or increased lockdowns that may be spurring a lot of these protests or events. So if I select here, we can also see that my dashboard is updating. And we can take a look over time on how many events took place here in the top right, where those events took place, and the event types. And say, if I want to lasso, take a look at this time period, I can also do that as well. All right, so I'm getting a good sense of my overview of the different events across the world using this dashboard. What I'm going to do next is select a country. I will select the United States. We'll take a look at the worldwide view of that. And interesting, we can see the trend here again. We can kind of see these three distinct spikes. Um, in the number of events, as well as the COVID-19 cases in orange in the back. So that's very interesting. Um, and then we're going to jump to the country profile to see a little bit of more detailed information. So let me go in presentation mode so this button works. All right. So now we're looking at the United States individually. We can see our label here is telling us what country we're looking at. So it's very immediately apparent that we're looking at the country profile for the United States. We have the total number of events for the United States also listed up here in the top. Then we've got our bubble map here on the left. Um, we have a couple of additional metrics here on the right. So we have not only new cases per week, but new deaths per week. Um, for the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as the events per week again. We also have a kind of dot plot here of the event sizes. So I was interested in looking at what were the largest events that took place um, that I were, was able to extract from that notes field. Um, and so the largest event here seemed to have about 5,000 people in it. And then we finally have the event detail. So all the way here on the bottom, we have the kind of finest grain of information, the most lower, lowest level detail that we have in the data set. So we have the individual events, what time they took place, uh, what type of event it was, where that took place in terms of subregions, the actor, as well as the notes. So the uh, lowest level of information is the individual notes on what exactly occurred on that date and time. So again, we can take a look at the data by kind of clicking around on the dashboard itself. So say we want to see an event size here. We can click around like this. We can see our dashboard on the right, sorry, on the left, our visualization updates, as well as the event details down below. You can also lasso these if you want and multi-select. Say if we only want to look at our largest events, we can again take place down below. And then again, at the end of the design process of this dashboard, I was starting to think about kind of what other questions is this analysis spurring? So this analysis is limited to these two data sources right now. We just have the COVID-19 incidents and the ACLED data source. But what other data sources could I relate to this um, in terms of maybe government response or, you know, what else could be important for this dashboard? And then I also started thinking about, you know, are there trends in the different types of events themselves? Um, could a good next step for this dashboard be to start using text analysis to see, you know, how many protests were related to mask mandates? How many were related to the government response? How many were related to racism, for example? So um, if I type in government, for example, in the notes here, and I click 
enter, we can see there's a, a text analysis field that's wildcard matching all of the events that have the word government in them. So if I put racism. So this is just kind of the beginning of the text analysis here. We can do all sorts of um, really interested, interesting things around, you know, embedding, you know, Python or R into this dashboard to start doing some more advanced analysis here. But this is kind of the jumping off point here to take a look at the different keywords in the notes themselves and see kind of what different events are occurring based off of those keywords. All right. So I want to stop here and I want to see if anyone has any questions on the dashboard, um, any sort of immediate feedback, and then we can kind of take the lens of design best practices, um, as well as kind of talking about the design process itself. So any high level thoughts on the dashboard at this point? Awesome, I'm really liking these questions so far. So the first two questions are actually exactly what, you know, the, the conversation that I wanted to spur on this dashboard. So what conclusions can be drawn from this dashboard? Um, or for example, would it be possible to compare two countries at the same time? So um, the first question is really related to our um, kind of actionable question. What do we do based off of the information on this dashboard? And so, like I said before, we're currently limited to these two data sources that I pulled in for this analysis. We have the COVID-19 incidence data, and we have the events-related uh, data from ACLID. So as we start to think about really getting into kind of those predictive analyses, what sort of other information would we want to enhance this dashboard? So say we have a hypothesis around, you know, maybe the events are being spurred from different government responses to the COVID pandemic, in addition to the rise in the cases themselves. Maybe one of our next steps would be to bring in a government response related data set to enhance that information and then start to look at um, some trends and some forecasting on, you know, when the government response increases, what do we see occurs in the um, number of events per week taking place? One of the other questions that came to mind as I was doing this was, you know, which countries are, you know, seeing the most unrest or the most number of events? And in order to make that um, kind of proportional to the country sizes, would it be relevant to bring in country population as well to show, you know, number of cases per 100K, cases per population, as well as events per population size? Because um, one of the things that can kind of obscure the real trends in the data is the different sizes of your samples. And so, you know, a country as large as the United States compared to a country like you know, one of the Caribbean islands, for example, there's a large discrepancy in population size. So by creating those baselines by population and bringing in that additional data set, we can start to look at, um, you know, cases per population size, events per population size, and which countries have the most event or case density and whether those two different um, indicators are correlated in any way. So, you know, as we're moving through the design process and as we start to build products, these questions will come to mind. Um, you know, as we're designing visual analytics. And so the dashboard is never finished. You know, um, this is the kind of ending point that I arrived at in terms of this um, conference presentation, but there's so many more questions that this dashboard raises that I would love to get to next in terms of making it truly actionable um, and show, showing the kind of predictive capabilities as well in terms of how can we predict the incidents in the future. So let's see, we've got another couple of questions here. Is this dashboard public? Great question. I can make it public. I can uh, publish it out on my Tableau public profile, and I'll I'll provide you all the link to that at the end if you're interested in taking a look at my other dashboards. Um, and then I can make that available to you there. Can it be embedded in a website? The answer is yes. Um, so 
Tableau Public, if you're utilizing Tableau as your data visualization technique, you're able to get an embed code from there and then embed it into any sort of website or application that you'd like. Um, Marcella, I don't quite understand your question. Am I focused on generating this information or on applications? So this data was taken from ACLID, so I did not generate the information itself. Um, but I created the data visualizations kind of as an illustrative piece for this conference, as well as um, to make it available to others. For a question from Adreen, how do you import and process the data to get to this point? How do you choose the elements you want in the dashboard? So importing and processing the data can be a whole nother you know, topic for presentation or this discussion. Um, I can provide my email address at the end and I'm happy to kind of discuss this with you further. Um, but there's also some great training resources out there on the internet in terms of you know, how to get started with a data visualization platform like Tableau, how to clean your data, how to get it ready, and then how to get to this final product. Um, the ACLA data is actually very, um, you know, the data is in a very good format. I didn't have to do any sort of cleansing on it to get it ready for this analysis. So I would say that's a fantastic resource to start with as you're beginning with analyzing data. Uh, great question from Tomas. Thank you for the presentation. How do you feed new or most recent data onto the dashboard? So this, of course, will be different based off of what visualization technique you use, but um, in the Tableau universe, basically what you do is, is set up a refresh on your data and then have your data come in um, either at the speed that your backend database is updating or at various uh, points in time that you yourself select. So you could say, you know, once every 15 minutes, once every hour, once every day. Um, with Tableau, you have the flexibility of choosing when that refresh takes place. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my email address in the chat here because there's quite a few questions here that I would love to follow up with. Um, we have a question on integrating our Python. Again, that's a great follow-up. Um, don't have a ton of, ton of time in this conversation to get into that, but um, I'm very fascinated with that as well and happy to you know, send you resources or um, have another discussion around that. Do you have any particular tutorials you think are good? Um, also, great question. I do have a link for you um, that I can share at the end of this presentation. All right. And another question on Python. Yes. Okay. So hopefully I'll leave about, you know, two minutes at the end so I can go and grab some of these links and hopefully share them at the end here. And then we have a question on spatial data. coming operating spatial and attribute data for each country. Okay, interesting, noted. All right, so we've got 10 minutes to go, I'm getting from the moderator. So I'm just gonna jump through the last couple of slides of this presentation, and then I'll leave about a minute or two for additional questions and for myself to gather the links um, so that I can get those over to you. So what we're gonna do next is talk a little bit about the design process, um, you know, how you get from data to a dashboard. Um, and then we will kind of wrap up and I will send over a couple of links for your review. But before leaving this dashboard, I just wanted to note kind of some of the design best practices that this dashboard is using. So um, if we're looking at the dashboard itself, we can see the template that's being used. It's uh, the non-data ink is definitely separated from the data ink. We've got um, the same dark color blue being utilized in the logo and the text related to kind of the title as well as the filters and legends of the dashboard as well as the button. Uh, then we have data ink that's highlighted in purple. Um, we're using orange to denote the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, there's a lot of white space here. So the map is totally washed out in order to show just the points themselves. Um, we've got only three, we've actually got four visualizations on this dashboard. So there's not um, a ton of too much visual noise for the user. Um, and then our titles and our titles of our visualizations themselves all are, make a lot of sense with what the visualization itself is displaying. So um, just to kind of close the book on the visual best practices being utilized by this dashboard. And I will definitely make this available to all of you um, on Tableau Public if you'd like to explore it a little bit more. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing and jump into my final slides here in the last couple of minutes we have.
All right. So a couple of visualization tips that I will leave you with. One great resource out there is the visual vocabulary. It is available out on Tableau Public. Um, this is a great resource that you can use as you're starting to design visual analytics to decide what type of chart best matches your data. So this is a totally interactive product. As you select any of these labels here, you'll get a bunch of different examples of the best way to display correlation, deviation, distribution, kind of what have you here on visual vocabulary. And I do have that link available. I'm gonna drop it in the chat right now so you can all take a look at that. That is a great resource for you. All right. When we're talking about the design process, I just wanna emphasize here finally that, you know, it's totally a squiggle. So that's what we kind of, how we talk about it within Tableau. We embrace the squiggle for the design process. Um, the first step is really understanding your data itself. Um, diving into the data, understanding the levels of complexity, the level of granularity, the different types of dimensions and measures there are, and the, um, you know, the different things you can display with the data. And then it's basically just throwing spaghetti at the wall to see what sticks. So um, the most time consuming part of creating a dashboard besides getting the data ready is generally just creating, you know, 50 different types of visualizations and then picking your favorite ones and picking ones that tell a story together. So we're moving from kind of increased uncertainty and unknowns to um, you know less uncertainty here at the end. But I do want to emphasize this is a very cyclical process. So as you're designing, you want to always design for your audience, host your listening sessions with your stakeholders, gather requirements, don't try to don't let perfection be the enemy of the good, and always request feedback early and often. So when we get to kind of a quote unquote finished product for a dashboard, it may spur a ton more questions and that may spin off another dashboard or it may sp spin off a you know full redesign of the dashboard or bringing in new data sets so um you know just keep moving through the cyclical process keep listening for those requirements understanding your audience and designing the most effective visualizations that can help answer those questions that are being asked awesome so that is where i will leave you today i we have two minutes so i'm going to grab a couple of links for all of you in the meantime um, and drop them in the chat here related to some training videos as well as R and Python. But go ahead and drop some questions in the chat if you have some at this point, or you're welcome to go off mute as well. So I'm gonna drop the link to the ACLID curated data sources first. That is a great place to um, download some data sources related to what you saw on the talk today. I'm going to do the Tableau training videos as well if you're interested in getting started with Tableau. These are very useful. Um, they're all free and they're all related by topics here. And then integrating Tableau and Python is another great resource here. Let's see if I can grab one quickly. All righty, here is a good example here. Oh, I'm direct messaging to the moderator. Thank you for that quick call out. I'm going to resend those. That one's the Python one. Here is the Tableau Learning. Here is the Acla data source. And then here is the visual vocabulary, since I don't think you got that either. And last thing I'll leave you with is my Tableau public profile. Feel free to take a look at some of the visualizations I created here. Um, and I will also publish out this example um, that we looked at today in the session so that you can explore it further. And we do have a request for R as well. So let me drop a link on that as well. Here's a pretty good white paper on that. All right. 
And then I'll finally drop my email address one more time. If anyone has any follow-up questions, you can reach me at either of these two email addresses. Um, and I'd be happy to continue the conversation or answer any of your questions there. All right, so I know we're at 10.01 now if you're in the Eastern time zone. So thank you so much everyone for coming to this presentation. I hope you have a fantastic rest of the day at the conference and you uh, see a lot of more insightful sessions today. Um, feel free to connect with me offline if you would like to send me an email or follow me on Tableau Public, take a look at my visualizations. Um, thanks everyone for coming and I hope you have a great rest of your day.